Hello. The recording you're about to listen to was recorded in Doylestown at the 2023 Doylestown Spiritual Banquet Conference hosted by the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown, which meets at St. Paul's Lutheran Church every Saturday night, 8 p.m. Food and Fellowship, 8.30 Speaker. Please look for us on YouTube at the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown and our Facebook page, the Conscious Conscious <laughs> the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown. Anyway, look forward to seeing you. Hope you enjoy these recordings. They were very powerful and lives were changed there. Please take advantage of them and share them with whoever you think could benefit from their talks. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Nick. I'm an alcoholic. We're going to go ahead and get started. Everyone kindly take your seats. Thank you so much for everybody for coming. What an excellent turnout so far. Welcome to the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Nick. I'm an alcoholic. Welcome to the December to Remember Spiritual Banquet Conference 2024. All right. Okay. Uh, just a couple, couple quick announcements. We'll get we'll get rolling here. We do have our hoodies back there, our, our uh, you know um, our swag. So if you want a hoodie, please let us know. They are free with a twenty dollar donation. Okay. And uh, periodically throughout the day, we'll be passing the baskets. Uh, a lot of time and expense went into this, so please, you know, by all means, um, please try to help us out if you can. Seven tradition would be awesome. So thank you. Uh, not too much else to report. We are going to go, go ahead and get going. Uh, to share his experience on steps one and two, we have Jimmy A. All right. You can stop the recording. Right, let me just get a little situated here. Pretty boy. All right, my name is Jimmy. I'm an alcoholic. Grateful to be alive and sober. And uh, it's customary where I come from to let you know that I have a home group. It's called the Design for Living Group on the Jersey Shore, Neptune, New Jersey. I have a sponsor. I have a service sponsor. Apparently, I need a lot of uh, adult supervision. Uh, that's kind of funny, right? No? It's too early for jokes? I don't know. Uh, Sponsor a lot of guys, but most importantly, I've been sober since my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that was on March 28, 1987. So, extremely grateful for this way of life. Thank you. Extremely grateful to be here today with my friends, and uh, looking forward to this day. Thank you, Ron, for the invite. Thank you to this group for the invite, and uh, we've been here a lot. Uh, I'm going to be talking about one and two, and we don't have much time, so let me start my clock. Um, so I was thinking, let me try something a little different. I mean, it's really easy to come up here, right, and tell our stories about how powerless we are and how unmanageable, unmanageable our lives are, drunk and sober. It doesn't really make a difference, right? But I was just sitting here and I was thinking about us gathering together today. I was thinking about uh, an important anniversary that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes that's coming up in two days. Uh, 87 years ago. Um, so I want to start this thing off with a, a little story. Right? And you have to participate in this because I think this is really important. Considering we're speaking on step one, what I would like everyone to do right now, if you want, it's your choice. You can close your eyes if you like. You can meditate on this, you can think about this, you can reflect on this, but I want you to go back to the day before day one. The day before day one. Now, I'm not talking about your last drink. I'm talking about how did you feel on that day before day one, the last time you came here, not the 15 relapses, the last day before day one, before you got here. The week before day one, the 
30 days before day one. The upheaval in your life, the spiritual disconnection, the emotional pain that you were going through. And I want to read a story. A story that many of you are familiar with. A drunk is lying in a bed. He's in a hospital and a doctor is sitting beside the bed. The drunk is talking earnestly to the doctor. A wave of depression came over me, the drunk is saying. I realized that I was powerless. I was hopeless. My life is unmanageable. That I couldn't help myself and that nobody else could help me. The day before day one, I'm in black despair. And in the midst of this, I remember about this God business. And as I rose up in the bed and I said, if there's a God, let him show himself now. All of a sudden, there was a light. The drunk goes on, a blinding light, a white light that filled the whole room. A tremendous wind seemed to be blowing all around me and right through me. I felt as I was standing on a high mountaintop. The drunk continued. I felt that I stood in the presence of God. I felt an immense joy, and I was sure beyond all doubt that I was free from my obsession with alcohol. The only condition was that I share the secret. And the secret of this freedom is that I need to share it with other alcoholics and help them to recover. The drunk paused and turned to the doctor. Ever since it happened, I've been lying here, wondering whether or not I've lost my mind. Tell me, doctor, am I insane or not? The drunk was Bill Wilson. Fortunately for Bill, fortunately for me, fortunately for us, fortunately for Alcoholics Anonymous, and for the, the thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people who have come through our fellowship, the doctor was Dr. Silkworth. By great luck, or by the grace of God, Dependent upon your viewpoint, the doctor was Dr. Silkworth. It would have been so easy to dismiss Bill's experience as a hallucination, one of the many possibilities of a rum-soaked mind. And as disparaging word from the doctor right at this moment, right at this point, could have, often, could have choked off the tender shoot of faith and killed it. Alcoholics Anonymous might have got started somewhere else, somehow, or it might not. Certainly, it, would have, it wouldn't have started here. Very possibly, the life of every one of us today hung on the doctor's answer to this question, am I insane? Where were you before the day, before day one? If there... It was there that Dr. Silkworth made the first of his indispensable contributions to Alcoholics Anonymous. He knew by insight that no amount of medical training alone can give a man that what had been happened to Bill was real. It was important. I don't know what you've got, he told Bill, but whatever it is, hang on to it. You are not insane. And you may have the answer to your problem. The encouragement of the man of science, as much as the spiritual experience itself, started AA on its way. So if you're sitting here today, what happened to Bill, what has happened to me, what has happened to many of my friends right here, what has happened to people in this room, is that lightning struck on that day. And lightning can strike again. So if you're here today, I hope what we do today, through sharing our experience, strength, and hope is, and as the flyer says, a spiritual banquet, hopefully we're setting the table for you to have a spiritual experience. To take what we're going to talk about, sharing our experience, and that's all we have is our experience, and hopefully apply it to your life. And have this, what I just spoke about, this spiritual awakening, this, this spiritual experience, this personality change, this psychic change, whatever you want to call it. But it really starts with step one. It really starts with the acknowledgement of this problem. I've told this story a million times. 
I'm sitting in a railroad room apartment up in North Jersey, overlooking Manhattan, and I'm getting a spiritual test. And this man was sitting across from me and he was asking me a few questions. The first question he asked me was, how long can you hold your breath? How long can you hold your breath? How long can you be in a 12-step program and not work the 12 steps? Was the question he asked me. Second question he asked me was, what your relationship with God looks like? Well, I'm a Catholic, I believe in God, but really, what does God have to do with any of this stuff, right? I'm a little jittery from all the coffee. <laughs> like, and plus, I'm sick. We're all sick, really. So you're all walking out of here getting sick. I'm telling you that now, right now. <clears throat> Third question he asked me, what makes you alcoholic? And the best I could stammer out of my mouth in that moment was, I drink too much. I had no idea what I was up against. No idea about the physical allergy, no idea about the mental obsession. I had no knowledge of any of that stuff. And then he asked me a question that many of you guys might not believe, but the old timers in here that were in my neighborhood know what it was like back then. He looked at me and said, where's your big book? And I said, what's a big book? And I'm sure there was a book at a podium or a book at a literature table. But in my neighborhood back in the 80s, it wasn't like that at all. It was speaker meetings, discussion meetings. We weren't into the book like we are today. And then he asked me, a, well, he didn't ask me a question. It was more of a consideration. If AA works, why do you have so many problems? Because the truth of the matter is, I'm not working AA. I have fallen under the delusion that maybe some of us have fallen out in this room. And that delusion is that abstinence is a solution to a spiritual malady. That if I just don't drink, I'll be okay. Now, I'm not embarrassed by my answers. I'm probably more embarrassed to let you know that I'm five years sober at this moment in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Dying from something I don't understand, dying from something we're not talking about. I'm dying from this thing called untreated alcoholism. See, I'm still that little kid that's at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm 29 years old. I'm dying from something I don't understand. I'm still being driven by that stuff that's all inside of me, this unmanageability of fear, pain, insecurity, you name it. And I'm dying in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Too afraid because of my pride and my ego to raise my hand and say I need help. But here I am at this afternoon, or that afternoon, with this gentleman. He's asking me those questions. Now the question is why, what makes me alcoholic? I don't know what made me alcoholic. As strange as that might sound to some of you guys in this room. I just thought, not drinking, if I just don't drink I'll be okay. I didn't understand this physical allergy. I didn't understand this mental obsession. Matter of fact, when we tell our stories on the first step, all we really do is tell our drunken logs, right? Or the powerlessness and the unmanageability. See, I thought my drinking was circumstantial. I thought it was all the things out there that was making me the way to feel I, I felt in here. You know, I tell the story all the time. I, you know, I grew up in northern New Jersey. I grew up in this... I'm 65 years old. I grew up in a, in, a, in a time, I grew up in a neighborhood where it's a tough neighborhood. I grew up in a real blue collar neighborhood. I grew up where, you know, all the, all the men worked, all the moms stayed home. The only requirement for membership in a neighborhood was five or more kids. You know, there's always an event going on in my neighborhood with so many kids. There's communions and graduations and you name it, birthday parties. From a young age, you know, I looked at alcohol as... I equated alcohol to fun, right? We hear this expression all the time, the disease of perception. The way I saw alcohol as a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old, is that alcohol equates to fun because I would watch my old man, I would watch the older guys in the neighborhood, I'd watch my mom and her friends and all, and when they drank, there seemed, a, there seemed to be a sense of ease and comfort that came about them once they started to drink. It was fun, there was laughter, there was all this stuff going on. So from a young age, I think alcohol is a good deal. I think alcohol is fun. I think alcohol is freedom. I think alcohol seems to be like problem solved. I got this guy, Dad. And like Peter says all the time, you know, my dad's cunning, baffling, and powerful in his own way. My dad's a tough guy. My dad's one of those, uh, you know, he would have been 97 years old today, you know. He, he's just one of those guys that never sat us down and talked about what's going on inside of him. Great provider, but he was a lunatic. My dad was an angry guy. 
You know, today we would say he had PTSD from being in the war. You know, he never talked about anything. But well, what I would witness, six years old, eight years old, ten years old, is the ease and comfort that comes at once. My dad would come in like clockwork every day, five o'clock. Mom would put two pictures on the table. One was martinis, the other one was Manhattans. And then I'd see my dad take that first drink. And he changed. All of a sudden became the guy that wanted to have a catch in the backyard. All of a sudden became the guy that wanted to... Uh, you know, throw, uh, tell some jokes. He just became a different person like many of us when we had that first drink. But don't let me fool you. There were those days. And those days looked something like this. My dad would take that first drink and then all of a sudden the kitchen chair would be flying across the kitchen. The plates would be flying across the kitchen. One of us young kids would be flying across the kitchen and he grabbed us. And so me and my two brothers and my two sisters at 5 o'clock, 5.05 every night, would get under the covers and pull those covers over our heads, and we'd wait for the tornado to go through the house. And when the tornado went through the house, we would come out, and it would be like, hey, Mom, the wind stopped blowing. Everything's grand. And we would never talk about my father's rage. We would never talk about any of that stuff. Now, none of that makes me alcoholic. But it makes me be a kid that grows up with a tremendous amount of fear. A tremendous amount of insecurity. But more importantly, I'm a kid that's grown up with a lot of secrets. You see, if you come from my family, you can come from my neighborhood, you learn how to internalize your emotions really fast. You learn how to push down that stuff. You learn that you don't share anything that's going on in your house outside of your house. You don't talk about your father's rage. You don't talk about any of that stuff. So by the time I'm 10 years old, I'm 11 years old, I need a drink. Now, I don't need, know I need a drink, but I need a drink. I need something. And 52 years ago, feels like it happened this morning. I can remember my first drink like it happened this morning. There's certain days in my early sobriety I can remember like it happened today. And here I am, I'm in a cemetery with five guys. And here comes that first bottle. It's Colt 45 malt liquor. And I put my hand in there with a tremendous amount of fear because I don't know what's going to happen. And I take that first drink. Here comes that second bottle. It's called Mohawk Blackberry Brandy. And I jump on that Blackberry Brandy and I start drinking that Blackberry Brandy. And what I can tell you about my first drink or my first day drinking is that I blacked out. I puked purple for about two weeks. <laughs> Went home, took a beating from my father. My mother apparently grounded me for life. And the hook was in. I found the magic elixir. I found that thing that just settled down everything inside of me. That fear, that insecurity. It made the secret seem okay. It was just this thing. And what I didn't realize is I just stepped on a path that goes to straight to pitiful and comprehensible demoralization. Because over the next 16 years of my life, it led me to full-blown alcoholism and homelessness on the streets of northern New Jersey. And that wasn't my intention when I started to drink. So I could look at a lot of things and blame my drinking on that. You know, I could talk about my dad. I could talk about that first drink. I could talk about everything. But it wasn't until I really sat down with a sponsor and started to go through the book and started to look at the doctor's opinion and really understand this thing, this thing like I'm a hamster in a vicious wheel, right? That I can't stop drinking. And I don't know why I can't stop drinking, right? I've had every opportunity in my life to succeed. My parents, even though they were like crazy, they were just that generation. But what they really wanted for me was good morals, good values, good education. They did all that stuff for me. And I rolled it up into a ball and I stuffed it right down their throat and I introduced my parents to a way of life that they never even knew existed. I'm still circumstantial. I'm a real believer that if I just get something out there and that out there, and fix, they'll fix this thing inside of here. So I get married, right? And I'm really fast forwarding in this story, I get married. And what I don't understand at the age of 25 years old when I get married is I have the inability not to drink. I have the inability not to pick up that first drink. I have uh, no idea that I got this thing called an obsession. I have no idea that I have this physical allergy. I don't know any of that stuff. All I know is I'm in this marriage, it's over my head, and I can't stop drinking, so what do I do? I walk out of this marriage. Four months of being married. Because drinking is more important than being a married man. 
Drinking's more important than being responsible. Drinking's more important than showing up to work. Drinking's more important than anything in the world. And I don't know why. I think it's normal. I've been drinking on a daily basis by the time I'm 18 years old. The alcoholic life seems the normal one. I'm hanging out with guys that look just like me. It just seems like this is what we do. So I walk out of this marriage and I take off for Boca Raton, Florida. We didn't know him then. <laughs> he, probably, he, well, he probably would have got me in more trouble, but I got enough trouble. I got in enough trouble without him. <clears throat> and I'm in this condo. Beautiful condo on the ocean. Looking out the window, I could see the boat, see the beaches, see the bikinis. Seems like everything a man would want. But you see, somewhere along the lines, God cracked my skull open. And in my skull, he put this chalkboard. And on this chalkboard, it was three emotions of shame, guilt, and remorse. And it seems to me, everything in my life up to this point, 27 years old, created that one of those emotions. The shame of not being a good son, the shame of walking out of a marriage, the shame of not holding a job, the shame of failing out of college, shame of not being a good brother, shame, shame, shame. Most alcoholics have shame-based identities. The guilt, the guilt of the people I'm hurting, the guilt of this woman I walked out on, flattened her, the guilt of hurting my parents, all that stuff. The remorse, all the things I was doing. When you live on the streets, you act like the streets. I'm in a lot of trouble all the time, locked up a lot, doing a lot of criminal activity when I was younger. Just a way of life for me. But I have an answer still. It's called Johnny Walker Red. And you see, I'm at this point in my drinking that I just need to crack the seal of a bottle. And I know that that grandiosity is going to come back. I know there's a sense of ease and comfort that's going to come and just settle down my mind and settle down my soul and settle down my, my thinking and all that stuff. And I take that Johnny Walker and I pour it down my throat and all of a sudden that little kid comes out. The one who blames everyone for everything. The one who's always pointing the finger at everyone for the way I feel. See, I have no idea about this first drink concept that you guys are talking about. I'm clueless on that. Mm -hmm. I'm the guy that's blaming everyone and everything and every circumstance in my life for the way I feel inside. And what I don't understand is I'm alcoholic right out of the gate. And what happens to me, I come back to New Jersey and, you know, rather than calling my family, rather than calling my friends, rather than asking for help, I make a decision to live on the streets. And for the next 18, 19 months of my life, I walk the streets of Jersey City, northern New Jersey, lower Manhattan, wherever, you know, wherever. That aimless walk. And I know there's some in this room that have done that aimless walk of being in the middle of the night, not knowing where the hell you're going. But you got to go somewhere. And what happens to me is I walk in a bar one day. When I walk in the bar one day, you know, this old timer comes up to me and goes, hey, you know, they're hiring guys like you in Newark Airport. Guys like me. <laughs> Finally being seen for my potential. <laughs> guys like you, matter of fact. You see, there used to be an airline called People's Express. I'm going back. You've got to be old and know People's Express. They became Continental and get United, somehow like that. And People's Express used to hire guys like us. And the job was to hopefully get the, the luggage that's over there on the plane that's over there. <laughs> I always segue here and say, and I'm looking at the older people in here, if you were flying through uh, Newark Airport in the 80s and you're still waiting for your luggage, I can make amends later. <laughs> and the interview process was like this. You walked into the room and the guy would say to you, can you lift the suitcase? Yeah, you're hired. I mean, that was, a, that was the interview process. So I'm in Newark Airport. The next day, I rob a car with two other guys. We're all sober now, over 36 years. We made amends to the guy that we stole the car off years ago. It was funny. Um, I'm a mess. My life's a mess. My life's unmanageable. I'm powerless over alcohol, and I don't know any of this stuff. I had no idea. Everything is circumstantial. Everything is outside of me. The problems outside of me, I think of my problems inside of me. I have no clue about any of this stuff. And what happens is I go and I talk to a man and he asks me if I can lift the suitcase. Yeah, go sit outside. And I'm sitting in a metal folding chair outside Newark Airport. You can imagine how many people are walking around me. 
And as I sat there, I could feel the wind blowing through my, the hole in my soul. When all of a sudden, a complete stranger sat next to me. And he looked at me, and after a couple of minutes, he asked me a question. A question that uh, was like the only kind of questions. He looked at me and said, what's the matter with you? People weren't asking me how my 401 was doing or how my, you know, how's that new car you bought? You know, nothing like that. It was like, what's the matter with you? And I spent my life story up on this guy. And I've told the story a million times where when I sat there that day, I couldn't even put it on paper what I felt that day. It wasn't until I landed in here and I opened that blue book and I started to read those stories. And when I read Bill's story and I turned to page eight and Bill talks about his first step experience, which I believe really gives us all our first step experience. Bill puts words to our first step experience where he says, no words could tell the loneliness and despair I felt in a bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I've met my match, I've been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master at the age of 29 years old, sitting in that chair in the middle of Newark Airport with a complete stranger next to me, asking me what's the matter with me. For some reason, I just knew internally that maybe drinking's a problem. Now, a blind man can see that. But as you all know in here, think about the day before day one, when we all couldn't see that. Until we made that cry or made that prayer, God help me. God help me. That story I read about Bill Wilson, he kept on drinking for 30 more days. He kept on drinking for 30 more days, even though he had that white light experience. On December 11th, 1934, Bill will celebrate, will have his 87 year sobriety date. That's in two days. In two days, 87 years ago, that white light experience happened. And we are all here today because of that. Because Silkworth did probably the most important thing. He didn't say, Bill, you're hallucinating. Bill, maybe I gave you too much belladonna. Maybe that hydrotherapy burned your skin. No, I, you know. I don't know what happened to you, but hold on to it. And here I am in Newark Airport, and this guy says to me, what's your problem? Is it possible for you not to take a drink today? And I was honest with the man. I said, I want to drink right now. It's like 10 o'clock in the morning. He said, try not to drink and be in front of this address. He pulled out a piece of paper, pre-cell phone, pre-beeper days. He said, try to be in front of this address at 7 o'clock tonight. And all I could tell you is, but for the grace of God, at 7 o'clock that night, I'm outside this address, 153 London Avenue in Jersey City, New Jersey. I've shown guys that I sponsored where I stood on that night. That's the slab I stood on right there. With my knees knocking, my stomach churning, my head spitting. Was I even in Newark Airport today? That's how delusional I was at that moment in my life. When all of a sudden, 1979, Chevy and Powell pulls up. And I see the stranger driving it. And there's a bunch of other strangers in that car. And he rolls up on me. Rolls the window down. <clears throat> And says, probably the most spiritual thing you'll ever hear in Alcoholics Anonymous. Get in the car. (laughs) And they took me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've been here ever since. So what makes me alcoholic? I'm five years sober now in Alcoholics Anonymous, and my life's so unmanageable, I don't understand it. But what happened on this day was a man confronted me at a meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm doing a little pitch like this on step two. I'm lying to every one of you because I'm paralyzed. What would you think about me? I'm so insecure about everything that, you know what, I'm just lying. I'm telling jokes. I'm, you know, I could give you a few lines from the 12 and 12. And this man walks up to me. I'm 6'4". He's 6'4". And he looks at me and goes, you're screwed. i a little bit salty of language. And I want to start a fight in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous because I don't know how to face confrontation without violence. But I take a step back like this and I look at him and say, you're right. I need help. And that next morning, I'm in that railroad room apartment getting that spiritual test. And what happened on this particular day is that man handed me a book. Because he knew I didn't have a big book. It wasn't this book. It was my third edition, which looks like this book. It's a a mess. It's falling apart. Right? And he started to talk to me about me. He started to talk about a lot of things on that day. 
And what I started to understand that my life is starting to change in here, even though there was a part of me deep down inside, I knew something different. This conversation I was having with this gentleman was like no other conversation I ever had with a man in Alcoholics Anonymous. Most of our conversations were surface, you know, how's the Yankee game, this, you know. Oh, yeah, did you see that the Giants beat the Eagles? I mean, all that stuff. Good, no Eagle fans in here, that's good, yeah. But the first thing he told me was that this book wasn't designed. This book wasn't designed to uh, uh, for answers. This book is a is a map to God. This book is a journey to God. Right? We've heard that saying all the time. This is this is not the treasure. This is the map to the treasure. It's this relationship with God that we need. This relationship with a higher power, whatever you like to call it. I mean, that's the beauty of AA. You name the power. And what happened over a couple of hours, man, that man cleverly cornered me into that place where we all have to get where I had to pick one of those two alternatives. Keep doing what you're doing, Jim, or accept spiritual help. The salesman did his job. He sold me on the first step. He sold me on the powerlessness, and he did that by doing something very simple that, you know, we complicate the hell out of all this stuff, and we're up here, and we're pontificating about a lot of things, but the truth of the matter is, he opened up to the doctor's opinion, and he turned to that paragraph, men and women love the, the, the effect produced by alcohol. Now, this might sound a little unorthodox to you. I haven't had a drink in five years when he's talking to me about this stuff. What he says to me is, Jim, I've been watching you. I see you in meetings. I'm the angriest guy in AA at this point. You know, that one guy that's in your home group and you tag him with that nickname, Angry Jimmy, that's me. And I make light of it today, but I was violently angry. I would stand over that little ex-wife like this big, and I'd be punching holes in the wall because the rage, the secrets, the insecurity... You see, I'm five years sober and nothing's changed in my life other than I'm not picking up a drink. I'm still that eight-year-old, ten-year-old kid that's walking around with secrets, walking around with insecurity, walking around with fear, walking around with every character defect. I have no idea what they are. And I'm an explosion, just like the fuse. And I'm exploding over the littlest things. I'm the guy that's road rage. I'm the guy that's chasing me on the highway. I'm just a lunatic. So he doesn't, come, he doesn't come at me with my drinking problem. He comes at with me that something is just as progressive as our drinking, and that's our behaviors. Hopefully this doesn't fall all over the floor. Oh. This might sound unorthodox to you, but I'll get to the point. Men and women get angry essentially because they love the effect produced by power and attention. He grabbed my attention right off the bat. The sensation is so elusive, why they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. They can't see what their anger is doing to them. They can only see what their anger is doing for them. To them, their angry life seems the only normal one. They are restless, uneasy, irritable, easily annoyed at everything, and discontent. Which really means I'm not experiencing any joy in my life, because I'm always angry. Unless they can experience this sense of ease and comfort, which comes out by taking what? Anger, gossip, judgment, punching walls, uh... Flipping off someone, you know, you, you fill in the blank. <coughs> Behavior, which they see others taking with impunity. No consequences. Some people can get angry and they could just move on with their day. After they succumb, they give in to the thinking mind. As so many do, the phenomena of craving develops. They pass through the well-known stages of a spree. Emerging remorseful, I've hit the wall 500 times. I swear, honey, I'll never do that again. The Alki National Anthem, I'll never do that again. <laughs> but here was the deal. 
Unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope for his recovery. Very little hope for me. I'm screwed. I understood that on a very, very deep level, that if I don't start changing, if I don't have this psychic change, I'm screwed. That I'll eventually go back to drinking. Now, obviously, he took me through this book the same way with alcohol. And when I look at alcohol and I look at the way I was drinking my life, you know, the ease and comfort that comes at once by taking that first drink. Drinks that people take with impunity, with no consequences. What I don't understand is I have this physical allergy that Silk Road starts to introduce us to. He starts to talk about this thing called no power, no choice, no control. Once I start, I can't stop. Very simple concepts, right? We could all agree upon that in here. How do you do when you take that first drink? Can you stop on your own power? We agnostics open up with those two questions. If you honestly want to answer these, can you stop on your own? Or when drinking, do you have the power to stop? No. That's really simple. We confused it by putting it into a pamphlet that used to be out in the 80s and 90s. I think it was 44 questions. Now we backed it down to 20 questions. But the truth of the matter is, this is so easy and simple for yourself. You just got to be honest with yourself. And I had to be honest with myself. Can I stop once I start? No. And can I stay stopped on my own power? Well, our stories are important. I told you a little bit about my story. My story shows really obviously I can't stay stopped. With all the promises, with all the, the wishes, with all the whatever, I don't have the power to stay stopped on my own. But you see, what I understood on this afternoon as I sat with this guy, Bill Grace, from St. Paul, Minnesota, the same place where our sponsor comes from today, ironically, I understood something on a level that I never understood. And that's called powerlessness. That's called hopelessness. Just like Bill talked about in that little story. Am I insane? Where were you before day one? Where were you the week before? Where were you 30 days before? I'm doing the aimless walk on the streets. I have no direction in my life. All I know is I need a drink. And when I take a drink, it seems to give me the ease and comfort. But what it's really doing is just lighting the fuse. And that fuse is just to continue to drink, continue to drink till I pass out, get locked up, or get separated in some way. I didn't know that until I sat with this guy and started to talk about what's in here. And he sold me on something that we're all, really, we're all salesmen in here, one way or another. And what are we selling? The first step. You're screwed. Right? (laughs) Now that sounds so simplistic and, you know, we can get a little chuckle out of that, but the truth of the matter is, if you're an alcoholic of our type, and see, that's the language our Bill uses. He tries to separate us from the normal temperate drinker. Alcoholics of our type. The one who wants to quit but can't on his own power. And that was me. But he didn't leave me hanging that day. And it's our responsibility if we're sitting with someone not to leave him hanging that day. Because what he did for me was he sold me on the second thing that we sell in here. And what we sell in here is hope. What we sell in here is there's a way out. What we sell in here is that there's a process that we're going to talk about today of walking into the darkness of our lives and start to uncover, discover, and discard the things that are blocking us from God and blocking us from each other. That's the power we have here. That if I'm willing to walk into this thing and to really shed myself of all the things that are blocking me, all these character defects, all the stuff we talk about through the process of the 12 steps, the promise is this. I could breathe a free man. I could breathe a free woman. See, what happened on this day is when he started to paint me into that corner, he, saw, he gave me that hope. He visualized what this really looks like. He talked about the two goals of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, there's two goals here, really simple goals. Goals, I believe, today. It's not written in his book. Here's the first goal, the obvious one. Don't pick up the first drink. But the second goal is the goal we all want to attain. And that's to step out there into the sunlight of the spirit. To have this spiritual awakening, to have this psychic change, 
whatever you want to call it, it's that place out there. Bill calls it utopia, the perfect place. A place where the bondage of self gets removed. A place where there's a relationship with a God. There's a relationship with you. There's a place out there that we can get free. But in order to get out there, we have to walk through the darkness of our life. You see, spirituality isn't about avoiding our problems. Spirituality is about attacking our problems. Spirituality is about getting these problems on paper and to share it with another man, another woman, and to walk into the darkness of our lives. I just want to... I've read this a million times. One of the most powerful readings we have comes out of a book called Daily Reflections, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. Right? If you turn to May 1st, if you go to the second paragraph, what he says in here is, it's the side of myself that I refuse to look at that rules me. I must be willing to look at the dark side in order to heal my mind and my heart because that's the road to freedom. I must walk into darkness to find the light and walk into fear to find peace. The way the old timers used to say it's like this, that Alcoholics Anonymous is a big bonfire. And most of us are walking around the fire, but guess what? Eventually the fire is going to burn out. But if you really want to change, if you really want a relationship with God, if you really want to grow, if you really want to let go, you have to walk through that fire and get your ass burnt and feel the uncomfortability of change. And see, there's one thing I can't do for anyone in this room, and none of you can do for each other. And that's put willingness in your heart. Willingness is an inside job. And what makes us willing? Well, as our good friend Ralph likes to say, a good whooped ass makes you willing. <laughs> but circumstances make us willing. Being sick and tired like I was at five years without a drink in my body, physically sober, life unmanageable, life falling apart, with no clue how I'm ever going to... F- get free. And what happened on this particular day, this guy walked me through that. Nowhere in this book does it say that AA is about getting us to quit drinking. I'll say that again. Nowhere in this book does it say anything about AA getting us to quit drinking. What is driving home, the point is, we can't quit drinking. Lack of power is my dilemma. I have no mental defense against the first drink. And as Silkworth lays it out to Bill in that hospital, without a psychic change, buddy, you're screwed. That we have to have some rearrangement inside of us. We have to start looking at ourselves and looking at our lives and starting to walk into the darkness and start really clearing out the wreckage of our past, the wreckage of the future. I mean, all the stuff that's blocking us from God and each other. Step one, simple. I can't drink successfully. I'm powerless. I got this thing called the physical allergy. Once I start, I can't stop. And when I'm stopped, I can't stay stopped. Very simple. Second half of step one, my life's unmanageable. Just look at it. Just look at it. Money problems, family problems, work problems. I got problems, problems, trauma, problems. Why are we problem people? Because we have a lot of problems. I mean, it's, that's what Bill wrote, or he put it vice versa, or something like that. Step two, came to believe in the power greater myself can restore me sanity. So there's nowhere in here that says, you know, what we're about getting quit. You can't quit. Well, what is AA designed to do? AA is designed through the process of the 12 steps. What everyone's going to talk about today is to find that power. Right? To have that transformation from the inside out, just like alcohol worked on us. We pour it down, right? The insides feel charged up. Boom. Later on, the 10 step says the, ten, the spirit comes in and it flows out to others. Same thing with this transformation. But guess what? Without this transformation, most of us are dead men walking in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Or you're just going to be a dry drunk like I was for the first five years. And hopefully you don't drink. Thank God I didn't drink. But if AA doesn't provide this transpiration, we're all dead. So yeah, the we agnostics is the wake-up call. And we can get very philosophical about we agnostics. Here's what we agnostics is about. Are you willing to set aside everything you think you know about everything? 
About what? God, religion, whatever it is. How about everything? Are you willing to set aside everything you think you know? And we do the set aside prayer, the lay aside prayer, a lot of different variations of that prayer. Are you willing to set aside everything you think you know for what? To open your mind, to have a new experience, to see some truth. Are you willing to put everything on the table and do something that I thought was a weakness at one point, which is really strength in disguise? Are you willing to be vulnerable? Are you willing to talk about what's deep going on deep down inside you? Are you willing to look at the common manifestations of living a life on self-will? Are you willing to look at all the things that are blocking you from God and from each other? Are you willing to bring down the walls of indifference, the walls of alibis, the walls of excuses? Are you willing to go out on a limb to get free? And that's what he posed to me that day. Either God is everything or he's nothing. What's your choice to be? Now, the ego always wants to answer that. God's everything, right? Then why are these bedevilments eating my lunch day in and day out? Because the bedevilments are nothing more than just examples of living a life of no power. Me on me. Me trying to arrange my life to suit me. And Marion will go into the third step and really jump on how selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of our troubles, even though we don't think so. It's your fault. Right? It's everyone else's fault. I say this all the time. I was born perfect and I was quickly handed over to these two character defects called mom and dad. I'm in like tipping. Right? I can feel like I'm on a boat. <laughs> Ooh, man. I think I got the first cup of uh, Starbucks this morning. I'm like uh, high powered. I was going to go into all the questions and all like that, but I'm going to end in a minute 45. Talks about lack of power is my dilemma. Let me not try to paraphrase because I'm not good at that. But I'll go to 45 for a second. Lack of power. That was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live. And it had to be a power greater than ourselves. Shortest line in the book is next, obviously. Is that obvious to you? That's what my sponsor asked me. Is that obvious to you? But where and how are we to find this power? I'll add another word to that. When. Where, how, and when. And what we know from our reading, where is God? Deep down every man, woman, and child. Or the fundamental idea. And how are we going to get to this power? Well, we're going to follow directions like these guys are going to talk about today. We're going to make it a, a decision. And step two is really a decision like step three. The decision is that I'm going to continue to be willing to believe in something. Maybe, I'm, maybe it is God. Maybe it's the ocean. Maybe it, whatever it is for you. Really, that's the freedom of, and the beauty of Alcoholics Anonymous. You choose what the power is. I'm going to be willing to walk into that. Walk into the darkness of my life and start uncovering, discovering, and discarding. Getting down to the common manifestations of living a life on self will. Bringing down the walls of alibis and excuses. To be willing to write that inventory, to be willing to share that, to be willing to do the rest of the steps. So at the end of the ninth step, when it says we've entered the world of the spirit, this is where I need my tech sponsor because I don't even know how to turn this new iPhone off. <laughs> Where is he? Where's Mickey Mantle when you need him? <laughs> Just lost my train of thought. Am I willing to walk into that, right? So where is God? Deep down in every man, woman, and child. Am I willing to search diligently to get rid of the things in me that are blocking me from God? And then I think the question we don't talk about is the when. When am I going to be willing to do that? Well, for me, it was when I was willing to not make everything else my higher power. In the last analysis, when I stopped making her my higher power, when I stopped making, making more money my higher power, when I stopped making all the external stuff my higher power, when I was willing to do that, when I was really, really willing to walk into the darkness of my life and start looking at my life and to get it on paper, Step two is the decision. Do you believe or are you now willing to believe? 
and I'm paraphrasing again, that there's something out there that could help me. And I pray to God there is. But on this particular day, five years separated from my last drink, as I sat with this guy, Bill Grace, you know, I was willing to go into the darkness. I was willing to get on my knees and do what Marion's going to talk about, make, take that third step. And I was willing to go in there and just shed myself of the things that have made my life so unmanageable because I really wanted freedom. See, in We Agnostics, there's a paragraph that talks about the evidence that there's thousands of us around that are free. There are people in Alcoholics Anonymous who have gone through everything. There's nothing new going on in alcohol. None of our problems are new, believe me. My sponsor says that all the time. Our problems are decades old. I just got to be willing to sit down with someone, be vulnerable, and share my experience with an open. That's all I have. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for an amazing job on step one and two. Uh, real quick, there's extra chairs in the sanctuary. You can help yourself over there, walk over there, and bring them in if you feel if you don't have a chair. Uh, we will take a 10-minute break, okay? And then Mary Beth is going to introduce uh, Marion. Uh, and what else do I want to say? Oh, mindful to our speakers. Our acoustics in this room are not that great, so get close, be loud, so everybody can hear you. Anyway, good stuff.